Welcome to Just Relationships, the show that offers you concrete ways to make your relationships better. Whether it's your boss, your spouse, your children, or your friends, the quality of your relationships in life directly affects how you feel about yourself and the success you achieve. Your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer, a psychotherapist, telecoach, author, and seminar leader, will interview top experts to help you learn to manage this essential part of your life. And now, here's your host, Dr. Duffy Spencer. We find many people today who are self-absorbed, who are anxious, who have low self-esteem, who feel depleted, who aren't getting enough TLC. And what do we do? What do we do when we feel this way, when we have people in our lives who are this way? Well, we certainly go for psychotherapy is one thing for sure, because the world is tough and we could all use a little extra help. Now, sometimes we can want love so much that we can be pulled in to people who are malicious or manipulative or unkind, duplicious. And how do we protect ourselves from such toxic people? Well, I am very, very pleased to have as my guest, Heather Kent, who is the author of Heal from Your Narcissist X, Heal from Your Narcissist X, The Ultimate Guide to Finding Safety and Sanity. Welcome, Heather Kent. Thank you so much. So, Heather, you have been practicing psychotherapy for several years now mm-hmm. you have you share in your book heal from your narcissist x your own journey dealing with a narcissist whom you actually married he acted like you know he had turned over a new leaf so those red flags that you had rightfully so became pink and you said oh he's really a good guy so Tell, tell us why you wrote the book in the first place. So it was actually a client who I was working with who um, inspired me to write. I had written a, a book previously just generally about toxic relationships. Um, and so, but I had been working with this woman and it was so interesting because so many people were showing up in my practice in these relationships with narcissistic personalities. And it was, I couldn't believe it. And I was, you know, in this smaller city and all of these clients were coming in dealing with this same problem. And so I had this one client and we were working through some of the healing processes from being with someone like this. And she said, you know, this would be so helpful if you would just write a book, because I bet you that so many other people are having this problem. So, and I said, you know, she just looked at me and so earnestly, she said, you really need to write a book about this specifically. And so I thought, you know what, maybe she's right. And so that was sort of the reason that I went back to write this second book, um, which was very specific to narcissistic abuse. Um, because I do believe that it is very prevalent because <laughs> I, it also, you know, it made me question, wow, if I'm, if I am one person and dealing with so many of these people coming to my practice with this issue, how many more hundreds of thousands of other people are dealing with this issue as well? So, you know, Heather, um, Christopher Lash many years ago, a few decades ago, I don't remember when he published his book. It was called The Culture of Narcissism, The Culture of Narcissism. And uh, it was primarily geared toward uh, uh, Americans uh, from the United States. And uh, and I I just said to you off air that I I find Canadians are kinder, gentler Americans. So, oh, Canadians, they're so nice. How can they be so narcissistic? But of course, if you a few people are, and what is your take on what makes someone a narcissist? What is a narcissist, and what makes someone a narcissist? So that book, I think, was uh, you know really cutting edge and ahead of its time because I think we really are living in that era of narcissism. 
um, yes. globally. Yes. Um, yes. So, yeah, I don't think it's specific to one country. And certainly we're seeing th- these personalities pop up in, uh, in many different parts of the world. And so in terms of what, what a narcissist is, I think that's also a really important question because it, it's a bit of a buzzword too. Yes. And so, you know, there's a difference between someone who is simply self-absorbed and, and very selfish versus someone with a personality disorder. And so the distinction, I think, is really important to understand. Um because the, the sort of hallmark feature that the DSM-5 highlights uh, in terms of a narcissistic personality is that the lack of empathy. And so, you know, it, it, for the diagnostic criteria, they have nine different sort of items and you only need to, you know, be demonstrating five of them for a diagnosis. But one of those is that, that inability to have empathy for others. So this no regard for how other people are feeling or how their actions might impact other people um, and very obsessed with getting positive feedback from others. And so that external validation is something that they all crave and that they are really desperately looking for because they can't validate their existence for themselves. And so they're this internally very insecure people which they are desperately trying to hide. They don't want anyone to know that. And so they put on this outward sort of show. Sometimes it's very grandiose. Look at me. I'm amazing. Look at all the fantastic things that I've done. The world would not <laughs> you know, exist without me kind of thing. Um, but not all narcissistic personalities are that grandiose. And I think that the limitation of the... Um, the DSM-5 criteria, which is the American Psychological Association's, you know, um, book for diagnosis, um, the limitation of that uh, criteria that they have is that it doesn't take into account these other sort of subtypes of narcissistic personality, because not every narcissist is looking for the spotlight. And so yes. that, that's something that's really important to, to talk about, I think. So I can, I can chat yes. a bit about that if you would like. Yes, yes. It's, it, I found your book absolutely fascinating. And, um, and I think a huge myth about narcissists is that they love themselves so much. Yes, right? it's, it's yes. actually the opposite. It's actually the opposite. They have a great deal of self-loathing and, and inner like secret insecurity. And the reason why they often lash out or accuse you of doing things that they themselves are doing, for example, or engaging gaslighting behaviors is because they can't accept responsibility for anything that they perceive as being wrong because that that would not feed this uh, mask and this you know persona that they've created to hide the fact that they actually really do not like themselves inside. And so they're desperately afraid of being discovered, you know, and so if they can't accept criticism, they can't accept responsibility for something that they've done wrong because that then feeds that self-loathing and that inner insecurity that they have. And so they will lash out and, you know, deflect and blame you or, you know, they're always a victim of circumstance. They can't take responsibility for their actions. I have clients who will say what you said in your book, uh, winding up apologizing to the narcissist. Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You try to <clears throat> tell what's prob- what the problem is, what's bothering you, even learning communication skills and, and I statements and not you statements and all of that. And no matter how you frame it, you're criticizing someone, this person, and um, they can't tolerate. And they can't even tolerate uh, disagreement. No. From oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yes. They expect full yeah. compliance. And that's one of the criteria, again, is like they expect full compliance for yes. whatever it is that, that they want. Um, and they also expect like uh, there's sort of the red carpet to be rolled out and have exceptions made for them. The rules don't apply to them. They are above the law. They are above the rules and, and they're, you know, everyone else is just supposed to do what they want without question. 
And how dare you question them? <laughs> and if yes. I do, it's not going to go very well. Yeah. Yes, yes. So is it possible for one narcissist to find another or is it always different? Um, no, I think that would be the ideal scenario, wouldn't it, for two narcissists to be together because then they can just sabotage one another <laughs> and leave the rest of us out of it. Um, and so that does happen, but it's it's not as common. I do find because narcissistic personality types seek out a specific other types of personality that are going to be more susceptible to to their manipulations. So for example, they will look for someone who, I mean, there's actually a big list. So they'll look for someone who um, has a history possibly of abuse, childhood abuse. They look for someone who is in a period of transition and so is more vulnerable. They look for someone who has um, experienced uh, narcissism in their past, perhaps from a parent, something like that. They also look for people who are from very happy families. They look for people who are very, yeah, very happy families, people who are very optimistic because those people are naive. And so they are not, they haven't been exposed to such things. And so they wouldn't know what to look for. They wouldn't see it. Wow. Coming. Yeah. They also look for people who are um, kind of fixers, like people who really want to help other people, who want to fix other people, um, mm. or people who are excellent at forgiveness is very mm. important. So, and obviously people who are highly em empathetic are, you know, these being empathetic and being excellent at forgiveness, these are wonderful qualities. Um, being loyal and loving and doing whatever you can to support your partner or whatever, whoever it is in your life. These are wonderful qualities, but they also make us more susceptible to manipulations from these types of personalities. Now, what strikes me, Heather Kent, author of Heal from Your Narcissist X, um, is that in your book and what you're saying now sounds very conscious. Now, sometimes it is. Yeah, and so many, yeah, so many people are so unconscious yeah. and they don't know what their subconscious is about. They kind exactly. of believe their own publicity. So I'm, stru I'm struck by that. You know, we we look at um, malignant narcissists as one of the four subtypes that you mentioned that many people are familiar with from some of our world leaders, malignant exactly. narcissists. Absolutely. And you you certainly um, uh, use Hitler and, and Stalin as examples um, when we're all familiar with those people. So, um, yeah. So I would say that the malignant narcissist, how, how aware are they? Or do they believe their own publicity? Oh, I think that they very much do live in this world of delusion. And so they, uh -huh. they, they really believe the delusions that they perpetuate. Because, again, like they have to subscribe to that fully <clears throat> to you know, <laughs> fulfill this false self that they've created and that, that, that they present to the world. And so, of course, <clears throat> the, the delusions that they create also fall in line with not having to take responsibility. Quite right. Different, right. And so if, if I'm not responsible, I can find someone else to blame. And that is what I will cling to for dear life <clears throat> in terms of my motives. Right. And so if because we look I at I yeah. can't handle being wrong or anything other than this perfect uh, illusion that I have. Okay. Yes, that's all right. So would you say that, that the other three subtypes, uh, I didn't want to get too much into that right away because I don't, don't want to tax people trying to remember, but let's just say sure. overt, covert, and the, the more, what's, what is called the communal narcissist that that you said has only been in the social science, behavioral science literature since 2015 or something recent. Yeah, uh, in the last 10 years, yeah. The last wow. 10 years. Yes, it's extraordinary. Someone who is uh, an over-do-gooder, who does everything right and who seems selfless. Oh, yeah. And right. yet everything has to come through them and from them and it's all about them being 
the best good Samaritan, right? The best do gooder, the yeah. bestest person in the whole world. Yeah, that is such an interesting. So if people can remember this, the communal narcissist, I found that so fascinating. Well, and that's, that's who I was married to. And so that's what I was dealing with. And so it made it really <clears throat> difficult because I can't count how many times I was told, oh, Heather, you're so lucky and he's so fantastic and he's so helpful and he's so amazing and he's so selfless and he's so considerate and, and all of this. And that was all true. Like it was true. He was a great friend. He was very reliable. He did show up to help, you know, the neighbors build their deck and he did volunteer and coach the kids hockey team. And he did, you know, he did all those things. Um, but all of it was for not being a good person and giving back necessarily because they wanted to do something to contribute. It was for the recognition and the accolades and the positive feedback that he would get as a result of those activities. And so it's all about the motive, right? And so they're all looking for this, you know, that constant external validation, which we call supply, narcissistic supply, because they can't supply it for themselves. So being the best good person out there, you know, the person on the committees, the person donating money, the person on the board of directors, the person, um, you know, in the news, doing all of these wonderful, fabulous things. Sometimes it's genuine, but and a lot of times it can be, I'm doing these things for the recognition, not because I genuinely want to, you know, use my privilege to help other people less privileged in the world, right? And so it is really difficult to make sense of it because you see all the great things that they're doing. And then people are telling you how great this person is constantly. Yes, yes. And then you go home. And you don't experience that at all. <laughs> and so it's very, so, yes. very confusing. Very confusing. And I'm so glad that you talk about the strategy of gaslighting, you know, and it's, it's such an interesting concept and it's so subtle. It can be so subtle. Yes, and yes. What's, what's fascinating to me is that it comes from a movie that was like 1930s. Yeah. Right. Charles Boyer and Ingrid Bergman, I believe. Yes, it was. Absolutely. And yeah. And uh, that they haven't done a remake of, of that of that story, which I don't think they have. Right. No. I, I think it's fascinating that we would take on that that title of that story. And it's so much in the vernacular. Well, it's becoming in the vernacular now. It really is. Which yeah, is a very true. good to know the concept. So mm -hmm. explain, please explain gaslighting. So gaslighting is one of the most common uh, types of emotional abuse and psychological abuse and manipulation tactics that are used um, by narcissistic personalities and other abusive you know, personalities. Um, and it basically is something that is done very, like you said, subtly, it's very insidious because, so you can't really pick up on what's going on. And the goal is to make you question your perception. The, the goal is to make you question your own reality and question your sanity. And so they'll say things like, um, that never happened. I never said that. Oh, you must've misheard me. You, you, you had too many drinks. You're not remembering correctly. Um, or they might even just say something like, you're overreacting. That was just a joke. Can't you take a joke? I'm sorry you feel that way. Or I wouldn't have had to do that if you hadn't have said or done this. And so, I mean, you, yeah, you made me. You made me. You made me do it. Uh huh. And so, and it's very like, you, you end up questioning, like, did I misremember? Is it, did I get it wrong? Maybe, maybe I didn't, maybe I did dream it. Maybe, maybe we didn't have that conversation. And you really do, you start to question because you're constantly being told, you know, that didn't happen or you're not, that's not accurate or, you know, you're making it up or, you know, you're overreacting. If you're a woman, especially, you're PMSing, you're too sensitive. Um, these are the types of things that they might say. And so then you're, it re, all of that is with the goal of you 
questioning whether what you're saying is accurate, whether you did remember correctly. And so you really do start to think, oh, maybe it is my fault. Maybe I did cause the problem. Maybe it is me. And so then you do start to apologize Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. the person. When you are trying to confront them about something that they did that was completely inappropriate, Mm -hmm. and then they say something that really destabilizes your convictions of what happened and makes you question, oh, well, maybe... Maybe I did get it wrong. Or maybe maybe it is my fault. And so crazy making, absolutely, absolutely. crazy making. Yes. Heather, Heather Kent, author of Heal from Your Narcissist X. And this is Dr. Duffy Spencer. We are just relationships. WHPC 90.3. So Heather, would you just share um, the, the 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 metaphor of gaslighting? Absolutely. You're, yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, a lot of people are like, what does this even mean? Like, why is, yeah. it, why is it called that? Um, and so, like you mentioned, Dr. Duffy, about this film that was created in the 1930s. And I think it, the film actually was adapted from a play even before that in the 20s. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, the, the premise of the movie or of the story is that there is a husband and wife. And this is, of course, um, set in a period of time when electricity is not prevalent in all of the homes. And so, the, the lights, you know, a lot of people had kerosene lanterns um, and sort of liquid liquid gas sort of lamps on their walls and the sconces on the walls. And so the, the, the lights would be turned up and down by these dials to, you know, make the flame more strong or, or to dim the flame. And so what was happening in the film or in the story is that the husband would go around the house and make subtle changes to the, sort of surroundings, including the gas lights. And so the lights, you know, the, the, the kerosene lamps. So he would go around and he would dim the lamps and she would say, Oh my gosh, did you see that? The light just dimmed. Like what's going on? And he would say, no, 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 sweetheart. The, the lights are fine. What, what are you talking about? No. Are you feeling all right? And so this would happen continuously over a period of time to the point where she really believes that she's losing her mind. And he is suggesting, I I, I think you're unwell. I mean, I, we need to take you to the hospital. We need to, you need to go see the doctor because you're, you're, I mean, the house is fine. Everything, everything that you're saying, you're hallucinating. And so, and she went crazy because the, the, her surroundings, her environment was being subtly changed by him on purpose and meanwhile, he's saying, oh, no, everything's the same. What are you talking about? And so she did start to lose her mind because he was creating that, that reality for her. And so that's where the term gaslight comes from, where you are purposefully trying to get, you, get someone to question their sanity, to question their perception of reality by manipulating and suggesting otherwise. Yes, absolutely. It is so crazy making, Heather. It really is. And it's so subtle and it's so insidious. And it is very hard to see when you are in it. Yes, yes. And in the in the story or in the movie, Charles Boyer was definitely nefarious. He married this heiress, or he thought she had a treasure in the attic. Mm Mm-hmm. And he wanted to, he would spend the nighttime going up into the attic and looking for the treasure. For the treasure, and she, yes, exactly. And so <laughs> all of this was with the goal of manipulating her into. Yeah. And then he, she would say, I heard noises in the attic. And he would say, you're crazy. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Okay. Now, that obviously is of the variety of the Hitler-Stalin you know, the, the over malicious, malignant narcissist. Yeah. So like the one of the four. Yeah. The difference there in terms of like a grandiose, look at me, I'm amazing. And a malignant narcissist who was, who can also be very grandiose because they still, they, they want, they want the glory and the power and all of that. Yes. Um, but the difference is that they, it is like they purposefully plan and they gain joy from torturing and like making other people suffer and and they will stop at nothing to destroy 
whoever they perceive to be their opponent or their enemy. And so that is sort of the real gateway to that the sociopathic kind of personality disorders, right? And so the malignant narcissist really is that bridge over to psychopathy, right? And, and uh, because there's that, not only do you not have empathy, but you actively seek and get pleasure and, and lots of secondary gains, whether they may be financial or, or power, or whatever that is. But the, 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 the joy and pleasure that they get from squeezing someone, from, from destroying them, from, you know, destroying their lives, that is the real difference between a malignant narcissist and, and the other subtypes. Whew. So we're looking at a sadistic sociopath. Yes. My goodness. And we have just a couple of minutes left, Heather Kent. The good news for everyone is that Heather is coming back next week. And this is a two-part series. So if you are interested in this topic, I find it so incredibly fascinating. Um, please come back to us next week to Just Relationships. And, and it, you know, the idea of somebody actually finding joy in someone else's suffering. That person is deeply injured unconnected, a, an attachment that is a very negative attachment. I think a rage, a hatred of, I'm not, I didn't get mine and you're not getting yours. I'm, yeah. I'm something along those lines, something along those lines. Yes. So how do we get your book, Heather? So actually, it's available for anyone to download for free, and they can go to my website. And my website is just um, heatherjkent.com. And there are links to resources there, and you can download uh, the book for free. So it's heatherjkent.com. H-E-A-T-H-E-R, J, is there a period? No. No. Kent, K-E-N-T.com. Heather, that is so incredibly generous. Well, I feel, you know, that everybody, I know when I was going through this and I had just come out of it, I know that I would have greatly benefited from something <laughs> that, like this wow. that just didn't exist at that time. And so, you know, some people who can't, um, you know, afford to have professional services given to them or they're on a wait list for two years, this is something that hopefully can be helpful. Oh, and I have so many more questions for you next week. I'm looking forward oh, to it. Wonderful, wonderful. So heal from your narcissist ex, the ultimate guide to finding safety and sanity by Heather J. Kent. Thank you so much, Heather. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And this is Dr. Duffy Spencer saying goodbye for now and wishing you great relationships. <laughs>